Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Open Mic VO. My name is Graham Spicer, and I host these little Sunday get togethers. I'd like to start this evening by stating unequivocally that I have never had an affair with Donald Trump, nor as a Canadian have I ever had an affair with Justin Trudeau. So I just wanted to make sure that we got that off the table before we proceeded with tonight's uh, festivities. Rules tonight are simple. Um, it's open topic tonight. So we're questions on any voiceover topic are more than welcome. No problem. Um, just want to ask you to please mute yourself. If you're not actively participating in the conversation at that given moment, it means we don't have any trouble with feedback or background noises, which makes it difficult for the rest of us to maintain the conversation. The second rule is to please be nice to each other. Uh, this is about being positive and supportive of the community of voice actors and want to make sure that all participants tonight, whether uh, you are a brand new entrant into the voiceover community or whether you've been in the business for a long time, um, you deserve to be treated with, uh, with respect. And I want to make sure that we are positive and forward looking and respectful tonight. Um, to those of you who are new, I just want to reinforce that there's no such thing as a silly question. Go ahead and, and ask and we'll do our best to, to answer for you. The third thing I want to mention is we are recording and I post the recordings of uh, Open Mic VO to YouTube. If you have any interest in going and having a listen to past episodes, you're more than welcome to do so. Just search Open Mic VO in YouTube. You'll stumble across the channel fairly quickly. and it's important you keep it in mind, though, because if you if uh, during the conversation tonight you provide any information that might be sensitive, or perhaps is proprietary, or you're talking about a job that hasn't been released yet, um, just keep in mind that once this gets posted to YouTube, I don't have any control over where it ends up. So let's get started again tonight. It's open topic, so any questions with regards to the voiceover business. So whether it's a question with regards to performing voiceover, acting skills. Maybe you have a question with regards to home studios and setting up a home studio. Maybe it's business development. Maybe it's marketing. Any question with regards to, uh, with regards to voiceover are welcome. Online casting sites. Maybe you've got questions about online casting sites. Any question is more than welcome. So I'm gonna start unmuting people here slowly. This takes a second because I have to do it one at a time. So once again, once you see that you are unmuted, feel free to ask the first question. Uh, or if um, you aren't going to uh, get us started, which is totally fine, then if you could please just mute yourself, that'd be awesome. Again, this takes a second because I got to do it one at a time. A couple of you might notice that I am I have not unmuted you, and that's because you are using an older version of the Zoom application. You need to update to the latest version of the Zoom application in order to be able to fully participate tonight. So just keep that in mind if you need to exit for a moment and. Uh, if you need to exit for a moment and uh, go and update your copy of Zoom and then come back, totally understand that. Good evening, everyone. This is JD. I'll open up the discussion tonight with a question. I am at a point in my career where I'm ready to pursue agency representation. So I'd love to hear from those of you with more experience than I. What's the best way to go about it? How do we do it? How do I do it without making people hate me? <laughs> Um, so I'll give a shameless plug here to start, and that is that I just did a, a webinar on this with uh, Sound Advice, Actors Sound Advice. And if you go to the Actors Sound Advice um, website, there's a whole webinar that you can, uh, you have to buy it. It's, I don't know, 30 bucks or something like that. Um, but it was a very, um, it was a very useful couple of hours where we talked about exactly this topic, how to go about getting an agent. But I can tell you that the short version is this. Um, 
agents are constantly looking for new talent and the agents we had three different agents on that webinar with us and they all reiterated they're looking for talent it's not as if we are overstepping our bounds by suggesting to them that we might be an appropriate talent for them um, they do it may take them weeks or months by the time that they actually listen to your demo but there's every probability that your demo will get listened to at some point. Um, but that doesn't mean that they feel any strong obligation to sign you. Um, and the reasons why they don't sign you is A, they just don't think you're good enough yet. Um, B, it's they already have um, one or more people on their roster that sounds like you and that you don't really add anything new and interesting to the to the roster that means that they want to kind of split the work up amongst more actors um, and those are really the two reasons why you don't get signed it's a matter of being patient and just getting there's a whole process actually that Kate McClanahan who's the coach that I co-presented with she outlined this whole I think it was an eight-step program or ten-step program on how to go about um, approaching agents, um, which involves a series of emails and what to say in the emails and postcards and, and other things. Um, and for more details about all that stuff, I mean, for the thirty-dollar investment, it's probably worth you. Uh, it's probably worth you picking up a copy of that webinar. That's to stream that webinar. Sorry. What? Pay for information in the voiceover industry? That's unheard of. Would you please post? Would you please post a link for me, Graham? Will do. Um, I, Thank you. I'll find it and I will post it. Um, Great. I appreciate it. No problem. Anybody else have any thoughts about like anyone that recently picked up representation, maybe, and maybe you could share with us the story about how you went about landing that particular agent um, really interested in hearing uh, it's not just about me and my experiences i'm really interested in hearing what others can add here sorry i'm just unmuting people here i can tell you i just landed a new agent um based out of um well actually i think that they're based they're kind of a virtual agency but um, I landed them because I met them at a conference and just chatted them up. And, you know, I didn't solicit at that moment that perhaps I'd like to be represented by them, but I just introduced myself and, and spoke for three or four minutes and then followed up afterwards via email and uh, got signed. So I was quite happy about that. Who else has got a story about getting signed by, um, by an agency? Come on, guys. I can't be the only person on here who wants to talk about themselves. <laughs> and they're, um, I, I'm looking at the list of people. I know there are a number of people here who have agency representation. So hopefully we'll get someone to step up and, and tell us about how they went about getting their agent. Damn, autocorrect. Anybody have any stories that they can share with regards to uh, getting picked up by an agency? How you went about it? Were you approached by them, perhaps? My very first agency representation was the agent that represents me locally. Uh, or originally represented me locally here in the Toronto marketplace. Um, they found me on, of all places, voice123.com. Um, uh, the lady's name is Tanya Buchanan, and she had been starting a new agency in the Toronto marketplace and literally went to voice, uh, voice123.com to search for Toronto based talent. And she reached out to me from there, which I. I mean, it's kind of like a unicorn. I don't think that, I don't think that it actually ever happens, but it did happen to me in that particular situation. 
Graham, I'm curious if um, you know, what is the progression to somebody becoming an agent? I mean, do most agents come out of the profession? Are they voiceover actors that simply decided they want to represent or position themselves differently in the market? Or mm -hmm. are they professional agents that may come from a theater background or something like that? Or is it kind of a mix? That's an interesting question. In my experience, it's a bit of a mixed bag. Um, some agents started as talent and somehow jumped from one side of the uh, business to the other. Uh, both, I'm thinking of my current agent here in Toronto, Roger King. He started as a talent and ended up buying the agency that represented him at the time. And Tanya Buchanan was originally a talent. But I think once you get to markets like New York and Los Angeles, um, being an agent is a real profession in and of itself, and that typically at the large agencies, they take on interns um, fresh out of college, and then the interns develop over time into, you know, the, the intern will become an assistant, and then the assistant will become a junior agent, and then progress on from there. Uh, so, and the other, so that's two different routes. One is uh, being a talent. The second is actually rising up through the, the talent agency ranks starting as an intern. And the third one is that I've, I certainly know some agents that started as casting directors and uh, decided after some period of time that uh, representing talent and being able to help them more in that kind of role is more in tune with what they wanted to do than actually running casting sessions. So those are the three ways I know of people becoming agents. And I'm curious to know if anyone else out there has any thoughts on how is it that you go about becoming an agent? Well, Graham, if you don't mind my asking lots of questions, um, you had said that you had a, <clears throat> a local agency. Um, so I, the question that came up for me was, do you have like an agent that handles local work and also an agent that would handle national or international work? Are those kind of separate uh, bailiwicks? It's not unusual in the non-union world for you to be represented by, you know, two, three, four, perhaps even more agents than, than that. And, and that's because many of the non-union agents now are working sort of in the virtual world, is that the agent that recently signed me actually has a telephone number that's based out of Los Angeles, but I happen to know for a fact that she works out of like Asheville, North Carolina. So... Uh, and just make sure that she is working on uh, Los Angeles time. So um, it, it's not unusual to have like a local agent in your local marketplace. And in my case, it, you know, it's PNA or PN agency based here in Toronto. My agent's Roger King. And he handles pretty much everything in Canada. Uh, I don't have an agent in Montreal. I don't have an agent in Vancouver. Pretty much anything that's national in Canada will come to me through Roger King and PN Agency. Now, when it comes to US-based work, I, I have, um, I, I'm with DeSanti Talent in Chicago. I'm with uh, Jeffrey Umberger, the Umberger Agency in Atlanta. I'm with this new agency called A Special Project, which is nominally based out of Los Angeles. But... 95% of the American work that I book is work that I have secured myself. Um, I've done a lot of auditioning for U.S. agents and have landed few jobs. And that's just because there's so much talent available in the U.S. And um, they often want to work with talent that, I mean, if I'm a client in Los Angeles, I want to work with Los Angeles talent frequently because they want you to physically show up to a studio to, uh, to record a project rather than have to work with you via ISDN or Source Connect or one of these other kind of, you know, studio interfacing technologies.
it's different in the union world where typically you'll have um, an agent in Los Angeles, perhaps a different agent in New York, but not necessarily. And, and you might have one agent for commercial work and you might have a different agent if you do on camera work as an example. Mm, thanks. You're welcome. You know, I hear, you know, we talk about LA and New York, Chicago a little bit and Atlanta more and more, but uh, one place that keeps coming up is Asheville, uh, North Carolina. And I know Dan Friedman is down there and you mentioned someone down there and I'm, I'm wondering if there are any attendees from that region that can talk a little bit about what the market is like in North Carolina. I ask because my sister lives there and it's quite a beautiful place. Does anybody know anything about the Asheville area or that part of the country? It is the craft brewing center of America. I mean, if you enjoy <laughs> that's, theaters, okay. there are so many breweries in Asheville. Amen, think. brother. So, uh, but other than that, uh, and you're right, Dan Friedman, who uh, many of us know as a, he's a voice actor and he does coaching and he also does a lot of work helping people set up home studios. Uh, he's based out of Asheville. Um, but uh, there are certainly many other voice actors based out of that area as well. Anybody here from Asheville or from the hood, somewhere nearby Asheville? Um, you know, Bill, I, I suggest that you give, like Dan is a really um, genuine and um, very helpful guy. I know that if you dropped him an email, he'd be glad to kind of fill you in on, on that marketplace. I, I get the impression that the majority of his voiceover work is not local. Like it's not as if there's a big studio community in Asheville, but, uh, but Dan would, I know, be more than willing to, to either respond to an email or spend a few minutes with you on the phone. He's just a guy that's like that. Oh, that's great. Well, I'm gonna go knock on his door one of these days. You do that. Hi, Graham. Hello, Pat. I checked the link on the webinar that you had suggested, yes. and it goes to sales ended. Is there another way to access that 90 minute webinar? Yes. Um, it, if you went to Eventbrite, that's not going to work for you because that was those were tickets for the live event and that happened like a month ago. Um, you're going to have to go to the uh, sound advice. Uh, it's uh, what's their website? Voiceoverinfo.com. If you go to voiceoverinfo.com, and they have a page there where they sell stuff, and I'm quite certain that it would be through that website that you'll be able to find a link. Thanks, Graham. You're welcome. Yeah, I want to put in a, a plug for that that webinar. Um, <clears throat> it was so interesting to hear those agents speak. I was on the road. I actually had to pull off the road and just sit there listening for quite a while. So if you have the opportunity to track down that webinar, it, it's definitely worth it for, for the gentleman that was asking about um, representation it was unvarnished uh they really were very brutally honest about the process and about their own situations and it was really worth looking or listening to uh if you're at that stage in your career thanks bill i appreciate the uh i appreciate the the plug sorry i'm just unmuting some new attendees here who else has got a question for us tonight? Uh, anything to do with the voiceover business? It's open topic night. So whether it's uh, performance based, whether it might be about business and marketing, maybe. I have a question. Hello, Joy. Hi. Um, I am resetting up my studio. I had had my recording space in one room and then my editing computer down across the other side of the house. And I'm trying to um, set up my, rec my recording area in a, in a different room. And I was wondering, it would be nice if I could just edit everything there. But I was realizing as I'm putting 
as I'm trying to set it up. Then I've got studio monitors in there, and they're making a little bit of noise, so I have to unplug them every time I want to record something. And I was starting to wonder, am I just going to end up having too much stuff in the booth? Is it going to affect the quality of recordings? Um, what are people's thoughts on that? Do, do I need two separate stations, or can I combine the space? Well, there's some people online here tonight that I know, you know, Stephen, I'm going to pick on you because I know that you'd have some some thoughts on this and you certainly have some credible information if you wouldn't mind sharing with us. I don't want it to be always all about Graham, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Hi there. This is Stephen Gonzalez out of the Baton Rouge area. Um, yeah, basically, in your booth, um, through experience and through asking people and through... Uh, just researching what other voice talent do, you want to have the minimum amount of equipment in your booth with you. Uh, for example, I've got a copy stand, I've got a monitor, I've got uh, a controller, and that's it. And I also have uh, an editing table that is just outside the booth that uh, that's where I do all my editing, uh, all my corrections and all that good stuff. Uh, from in, in there. Uh, some people say, well, you can have your computer in the booth. Well, if you have small diameter, high RPM fans, your microphone's going to pick that up. So uh, again, basically minimum amount of stuff in the booth with you, um, especially if you're an audiobook narrator, uh, which, you know, you need a room, uh, a noise floor of minus 60 or below and anything beyond, you know, minimal, uh, uh, equipment will will shatter that uh, room t uh, that noise floor uh, so anyway that's that's my thoughts so yeah and I'm with you Stephen is that uh, you know in my booth I have my iPad holder my microphones and that's about it and uh, my editing station which is actually where I'm sitting here now is is where I actually you know, the monitors and everything are all here, but there's nothing in the booth with me other than the microphones and a coffee stand. Exactly. I mean, you just, you, again, you want the minimum of what you need in that booth with you. Um, and if you have like, say, a, a, a paper book, then, um, you know, you may want to have a, a book stand as well to put on your copy stand, uh, maybe an adjustable chair. Uh, I don't have a chair in my booth. Uh, I just stand up and, and, you know, do the, do the projects as much as I can. Uh, but uh, again, you Steve, know, minimal. You record, you record audiobooks standing up? Yes. Now that is a commitment. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm, I've, I've been in bands since 86 and we're used to, you know, two and a half hour, three hour sets. And then you sit down for about, you know, about 30 minutes and then you get back up on stage for a little while. So, you know, I'll go two, two and a half, maybe three hours standing up. My hat's off to you, man. That's, uh, <laughs> that's a lot of, that's a lot of standing in a, what is typically a warm, stuffy booth. So yeah, a padded cell. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Hey, Steve. Graham. Um, this is Blair. And I'm glad we're kind of talking about audiobooks because my question is sort of related to some equipment uh, with audiobooks. So I've been trying to edit and you, well, back up. I record uh, standing up with my headphones on and then I try to do some editing right after that. And the earphones really hurt my left ear a lot. And so someone suggested I get earbuds, I guess, for the editing process. But the you know the plug for the earbud doesn't fit my um my a fast track and so they said oh you get this adapter but i went online to try to figure out exactly what to get and i'm a little confused by all the letters and the numbers of the different head headsets or earbuds and adapters can someone help with some recommendations for those so what you need is the exact opposite of this where this has a, a quarter inch that goes down to an eighth of an inch, mm -hmm. you can get the flip of this, which has, you know, an eighth of an inch plug or an eighth of an inch jack and a quarter inch plug. Um, they're right. like a dollar ninety nine at Guitar Center. 
Yeah, but this person who was telling me about it, actually it was David H. Lawrence, he was saying that it was really important that I get earbuds that don't have, you know, there are a number of rings on the tip. And he said, make sure it doesn't have multiple rings. It just needs to have one ring, I think is what well, he told me. It needs to but have two. Like, I don't, the, I don't know, is this the in earbud, The earbud part, the end of the earbud. Oh, not the plug. You mean the actual earbud itself? Yes. He said there were some specific ones that you needed to use to make that work with your, um, what's it called? The, the fast track system. If and he, I couldn't use any if, earbuds. Hmm? If, he, if he was using the term rings, I'm sure he was talking about the, the plug and I'm trying to get that in. Band. Yeah, it's the little band, the painted band. band. There we go. Oh, I just, I just blew it. Is that in focus now? You see how uh -huh. two little black rings? Right. He told me to look for some that only had one one band, I thought, but I can't find any. Yeah, no, they're, they're going to have two or they're going to have three. So you can't have one that has three. Okay. If it has, because those, those ones are specially made for specific smartphones and stuff. But you can have ones that have two and it'll work. Okay. And so these adapters are just, you said, kind of a dime a dozen. They, they all work and it's no big deal. And I don't need to worry about all these letters and things. No, go to, you know, you, you need an eighth of an inch to a quarter inch adapter. And an eighth of an inch to a quarter inch stereo adapter. And Amazon Basics will have them for a buck ninety nine or Guitar Center or Sweetwater, any one of those places. If there's a, a Guitar Center nearby you. Uh -huh. uh, no. Now, you said you'd been using earphones. Were those professional earphones? Yes. I don't remember who made them, but yeah, they're lovely and they're wonderful. You but... might want to check the end of that. That quarter inch adapt, that quarter inch cable that's at the end of it that you plug in mm -hmm. often is an adapter in and of itself. And if you try and unscrew it or pull it, okay. it will come off and show that it actually is an adapter. And you could see. They won't always fit other things because of the screws, but you could see if it would fit. Oh, thank you, Joy. I'll take a look at that. Okay. Yeah, and that's a good point, Joy, because so many of the kind of consumer and prosumer headphones now come with the eighth of an inch jack, and then they just put the quarter inch on the, on the end of it. So that's a very good point. Thank you for pointing that out. Thank you all. I'd like to ask... Um, uh, Stephen, a question, if he doesn't mind, because I heard the, the difference between your workflow, Graham, and Stephen's is that uh, Stephen keeps a controller in his booth. And <clears throat> I would imagine that in the course of doing audiobooks, there might be, you know, times that you want to stop and start or rewind or, uh, you know, redo something. And it seems that it would be trouble to have to get up and leave your booth. Uh, I could never, I could never do an audiobook with the way I'm set up here now. I'd have to rejig so that I could record here at my editing station because there's no way I could do it from the booth. But I'm going to turn it over to Stephen um, to talk about how he uses his controller in the booth so that he's able to work remotely. Yeah, and I'm I'm curious as to whether you use the uh, the QWERTY keyboard as your controller, or if you have a, a designated controller like. Um, uh, a, f a fader port or something like that. Yes, actually, I have a um, Contour Designs Shuttle Pro V2 that I use in the booth as well as on the editing table, and they're keyed the same. And in the booth, I have record, stop, and marker, and then I use the central jogging wheel to, you know, whenever I do punch and roll, for example, I'll stop the recording. I'll jog to where I want to pick up and I'll hit record again. And that's how I do punch and roll. Just, to, you know, that one little controller there. I don't even have a QWERTY keyboard in the booth with me. And uh, then, go ahead. No, this is very interesting. I, you know, I use different controllers as a, I have a studio that's more for music, but I had never seen this. I'm going to post this link to this Contour Design Shuttle Pro. It looks like a mouse, but it really I, is I've for got video. I've got one. There it, ah! <laughs> there it is. It is an incredible piece of equipment. It's, a, it's almost $100, but it is so worth it. 
I mean, it's an, it's an incredible thing. I hardly ever use a, a QWERTY keyboard in the editing process and I don't in the recording process. Uh, well, I say that whenever I'm doing e-learning, I do have a QWERTY keyboard with me only because I label the markers and that way I'll know where the slides are in the deck. Uh, but other than that, if I'm doing say an audio book or, or whatever, I'll just have the, the Shuttle Pro in, in with me, that's it. That's all I need. Yeah, that's brilliant. I use uh, the Shuttle Pro, con the Contour Shuttle Pro Pro uh, w in my left hand, and I have a Kensington trackball in my right hand, and I hardly ever need to touch the keyboard. That's ambidextrous. I am left-handed, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good with uh, a mouse in either hand, so it works out okay. I have posted that link if people want to take a look. Thank you so much. That's great, Bill. It's a great product. I, I totally, uh, I'm with Stephen. I heartily endorse it. It's a, it's a great piece of, uh, of equipment. Well, and for gearheads, I mean, there's no bad piece of equipment. Hey, Graham. It's uh, Don from Erie, PA, One, almost neighbors. Hey, how are you, Don? Good, good. How are you? Thank you for the link or the notification that I needed to update uh, Zoom. Thanks. I appreciate it. Uh, the, question, the question I had was, uh, Stephen said something about monitors. How important is it to have a monitor? As far as what? Oh, as well, as a, a, a visual monitor, not an audio monitor. No, audio monitor. I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to be doing any kind of engineering, uh, which, you know, there are some schools of thought on that. Uh, some people say, well, you're a voice actor, not an audio engineer. And then there's other people that say, well, lately the clients want us to be engineers as well. Um, I have two KRK Rocket 5 monitors, audio monitors, on either side of my uh, editing uh, table. And that way it, it precludes me from having to wear earphones or earbuds or anything like that. And um, that's just an, also an extra set of uh, speakers, so to speak, that I can listen to what it's going to sound like, raw, processed, whatever, uh, in addition to the headphones, in addition to the earplugs, in addition to, you know, computer speakers. Uh, you know, you want to, if, if you're going to be the one that's going to be doing the processing, you want to get as many um, quote unquote opinions as possible from the different speaker systems. So that's why I have them. All right, cool. Thank to you very much. Mind on that. It's important when doing your editing through monitors is that you should have a listen to it through headphones as well for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's easy to, it's easier to miss stuff, clicks and pops and stuff. If you're just using studio monitors, the second thing is the studio monitors that most of us would use don't have very, uh, very much low end extension, which is not an issue when it comes to our voices because there's nothing really usable in our voices much below 90, 80, 90, 100 hertz. The problem though is if there's any sort of rumble or hum in your recording, you won't hear it through the studio monitors. Um, like I live only, I don't know, 150 yards from a, uh, from a um, streetcar line. And if I don't, if I'm not careful listening through my headphones, sometimes I won't hear through the monitors um, the rumble that the streetcar can sometimes add into my recordings. So those are the kind of things you need to be cognizant of. Yeah, and to, then to piggyback on what Graham just said, I mean, I live in South Louisiana, and 10 months out of the year, it's a fashion that daily, one of my neighbors is going to be mowing his grass. And or, you know, you'll have uh, construction around and you'll hear a dump truck. Uh, and all that produces rumble. I have some friends of mine that they live in a, in a house such that the refrigerator causes rumble whenever it's on. Uh, whenever the compressor kicks on. So, yeah, if you definitely want to, you know, to 
listen for that as well. Okay, thanks. The reason I asked was because my one my coach was telling me I should get monitors, and I I was like, okay, well, I, I guess I could get them. I've been using headsets and whatnot, but uh, when I'm going through a real quick process, and I just have regular computer monitors or uh, speakers. That's all I use. Well, I have you know reasonably nice studio monitors here and the majority of their use is playing spotify when i'm sitting doing something else so um i i certainly think that it's perfectly um it, it's perfectly reasonable for a voice actor to be able to do their job without ever needing studio monitors um i think you can do what it is that you need to do through headphones just fine good uh, i can get that shuttle pro instead <laughs> yeah Steve, um, a question from Paula asking about the Contour Shuttle Pro. Does the device work only with certain software? And if so, which? The answer to that question is absolutely not. It works with any software. Then it doesn't matter if it's on Mac or on PC. Uh, they, the, the, the way that it works, you tell, you tell the Shuttle Pro, when this program is fired off, then you're going to have these keystrokes assigned to you. So like, for example, if you're in Twisted Wave, this would be one set of, of, um, of keystrokes assigned to the, to the Shuttle Pro. If you're in um, Pages or Word or whatever, uh, your internet browser even, you can set up keystrokes for your web browser like Safari or, or Chrome or whatever. Um, email, same thing. It's just that I, um, I happen to use it for, for you know, audio editing, but you can use it for anything. Fantastic, thank you. Paula, hopefully that answers your question. Um, who else has got some questions for us tonight? Um, anything to do with voiceover? It's open topic night tonight. Hello. Hey, Melinda. Hi there. Um, sorry, I was just sitting and eating, so I, I muted myself. Um, I have a couple of questions um, for anybody and everybody. Um, the first one is, uh, what is your favorite mic that you would recommend that's preferably uh, cost less than a car or something? Um, there's some really pricey ones out there. and. Um, Anyway, I saw uh, someone recommended a Neumann something or another, and then I, it was like over $3,000, and I'm like, okay, I don't think I'll ever get one of those. But anyway, um, I'm just looking around for some ideas on different ones, and, um, <clears throat> and if you prefer a USB or not. And um, So that's my first question, if anyone has uh, thoughts on that. Who wants to render an opinion on on uh, microphones? Which zon uh, which genre do you wish to uh, you know which genres do you wish to uh, specialize? Oh boy, um, I'm not quite sure yet. Um, I've never heard that before. I've heard I used to hear people saying, um, "Is it the the road?" makes is makes a female voice sound better and i don't know about that um and then i've heard now just get in front of a mic and talk and then about the genre thing um does that really make a difference potentially it can um mm -hmm. if you're wanting to go into audiobooks for example then there's you know certain mics that will that will do you uh, better service than others uh the whole point is to make the, the microphone, you want the microphone to make you sound like you, as our, you know, one of our good friends in the voiceover world says it. Um, listening to your voice, I've got, I have two that come to mind, the Rode NT1 and the Neumann TLM 102. Um, you have not necessarily a soprano voice, you have like an alto voice but it's it's um it's got a, a brightness to it 
and the NT1, not the 1A, but the 1. Um, I've, I've dealt with other uh, voice talent, uh, female voice talent who have used it and uh, it, do, it does not really good service. Uh, the more expensive one, the TLM 102 is, um, is one of my favorite microphones uh, to recommend to people with your type of voice. Excuse me, I'm <laughs> sorry about that. Um, it warms the voice and it really makes, makes your already sort of lush voice even more lush and uh it'd be great either for audiobooks or for e-learning if you want to go into commercial um mm -hmm. then maybe more the you know i don't know the I, I don't i don't know if you if you're trying to do commercial maybe the at what is it uh 2030 i think is what it is i can't remember but anyway, those two, those two mics, especially the NT1 and the 102, not the 103, the 102, um, uh, listening to your voice, those are the ones I would recommend. Yeah, and then th those are great. Uh, those are great options, Stephen. The NT1, I've always been a big, a big fan of. And and what Stephen mentioned, the distinction between the NT1A and the NT1 is important because the NT1A sounds completely different. Hmm. Uh, but the NT1, it comes with a very good quality shock mount. It comes with a pop filter. I mean, it's just um, a, a very well made, very well voiced mic. And I think it's like $239 or something like that. It's an amazing deal. The other one, the TLM 102 from Neumann, which is a German uh, made microphone, is considerably more expensive. I think the kind of list price in the U.S. or the street price in the U.S. is, I think it's like five seventy nine or six twenty nine or something like that. But it's a microphone I use practically every day, and it's a phenomenal sounding mic, and and also very uh, flattering on on most voices because it's quite flat in its frequent frequency response. Versus the TLM 103, which has quite a, a pronounced um, uh, a bump in the frequency response above 4,000 hertz, which can be not as flattering on some voices. And okay. as far as the uh, USB versus non-USB, the jury used to say, well, don't worry about the USB yet because the technology is not there yet. Uh, go with your regular microphone going into an XLR preamp and all this good stuff. The technology is catching up uh, as far as USBs are concerned. There are some, some good quality ones um, in general, and I'm making a very big generalization here. Um, I would still stick with the, uh, I would still stick with the XLR microphone with a, with a preamp for now, maybe in about a year's time or 18 months, the USB technology will catch up finally, you know, to be very competitive with it. As by the way, I so said 18, 20, 35 is what I was thinking of. Okay. Maybe someone, uh, if you had a moment, could just pop some of those links into the uh, chat box. Again, if you had a moment, that might, uh, might help, uh, help out. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, I have one other question um, because I've been hearing it come up a lot lately about, um, <clears throat> is, if this is the way to say it correctly, Sound Connect, is that what it's called? Source Connect. Source Connect, okay. Um, yeah, um, I have gone around to a few different agents or agencies and they'll mention you have to have that. And uh, I was feeling frustrated. I thought, I have a home studio, I have a website, I have demos, and now I need this too. And, um, you know, isn't this something that I can just say, well, I, I, like I, I don't have it, but I can go down the street and use somebody's studio. And, and someone mentioned they like people to have it who work out of their home studio so that um, the client can talk to you face-to-face, -face, I guess like a Skype. Yeah, it's, it's more than that, though. The, the thing about Source Connect is that when you when you connect via Source Connect, the remote studio, the studio that you are connected to, is uh -huh. actually recording you in broadcast quality 
at the at the very time you're speaking. So you don't you're not even recording necessarily at your end. Oh. Versus okay. if you're just using like a phone patch or a Skype connection, and which is fine if all that the if all of that the uh, client wants to do is just to give you direction. But you have to record locally, and then afterwards you have to send them the file that you recorded, because the signal they're getting down the pipe at their end isn't of reproduction quality. So that's the big reason why they like Source Connect is because they're actually recording you in real time at their end, whether it's ten miles away or whether it's you know a half a world away, they can record you in broadcast quality. Does that okay. make sense? you understand the distinction? No. Yeah, I'm, I, I appreciate your, your explaining this because um, I was feeling frustrated too with having had some training and, and uh, I hadn't been taught this, you know what I mean? And now I feel like uh, I'm hearing it out there and it's almost like I'm, I'm going places and saying, take me, I'm yours, you know, you can hire me and all this. And they're like, well, do you have this? Well, then we can't take you. Yeah, so, it, it's um, not a very... I mean, source can, the basic Source Connect software is only, well, is only, it's still fairly expensive. I think it's $595. Um, so it's, it's really not unreasonable um, because it, it does allow you to connect, you know, in real time with a remote studio. The other option is there's a, a web-based version called Source Connect Now, which is Free, I think, but it requires you to be set up and and uh, connecting with them through a web browser, hmm. and and it's not quite as robust a connection as I understand it as using the full Source Connect package. I'm not sure. I've never used Source Connect now because I do own the the, the full so Source Connect software, uh -huh. um, but. It, um, I, I know of many voice actors who say that they've used Source Connect now or there's a kind of an equivalent web solution called IPDTL, IPDTL, um, and that they've used those, you know, free solutions very successfully for years, um, you know, for a couple of years and have had no issues with them. So... Uh, I throw that out as an alternative if the $595 for the Source Connect software sounds uh, a little steep. Is that price uh, once a year or is that just a buyout to own it? It's a buyout. You, you buy the software for $595 and then I think that there's an annual, um, like an annual service fee that you pay them for support, okay. uh, but it's not very expensive. The, okay, the, the annual thing is not that expensive. Uh, I'm just uh, trying to catch up with some notes here. Uh, Stephen Gonzalez is uh, typing a few things into the uh, chat window. If you're interested, uh, connections for uh, Source Connect, for IPDTL, some pricing information as well. Thank you so much. Um, Emily kind of chimed in. Stephen did. Um, Jim did. Thank you all so much for that. Great. Great. Who else has got a question for us tonight? I have a follow-up question from my question right at the beginning. This is Joy. Hey, Joy. Hey. Um, so my studio isn't exactly a completely enclosed box. We took an extra bedroom and converted it into a family closet. And that means we filled it with shelves and hangers and put everybody's clothes and all the extra blankets and pillows and cloth for the entire house that we could find and just filled everything. And then I have a four by four area that I have blankets hanging from around to make kind of a, 
um, an enclosed, but not super, it's not, not very sound resistant, but it does uh, contain the air, you know? Um, and, uh, and then the other side, and we have a, there's gonna be a hole into the next room that my computer will be in. So that computer will never be in the same room as me, but we're gonna run wires in, and some of it will go to my studio where I'm actually recording. But I was, the space that we were hoping to use for my, um, if I need a second location, so I don't have everything in the studio, but to have a separate editing location is just across the room. <laughs> and it's gonna have like, massive amounts of shelving and stuff in between and um, uh, we're putting in some open walls that are just filled with insulation mm -hmm. um, but I'm gonna have another screen and a keyboard and my studio monitors there is there um, what's the potential backlash for that um, it sounds reasonably well thought out. Um, a question I have is the, um, the blankets that you are mentioning that are hanging around your four by four foot area, are they like bedding or are they moving blankets or acoustic blankets? Um, I'm in the process. They have been... Um, like uh, sleeping bags, yeah. and I'm in the process of researching and buying acoustic blankets to hang around. That will make a big difference, you'll find. Yeah. Uh, the, the acoustic blankets are, are quite a bit more effective than even a sleeping bag would be. Joy, I, I just did a whole lot of reading on acoustic blankets because I have lots of acoustic problems here. Uh, yeah. and, and in a moment, I'm going to post uh, something in the chat window. It's actually like a synthetic velvet curtains that just kept coming up and blog after blog after blog. Give, give me a second and I'll see if I can track that down for you. That sounds fabulous. I was actually um, thinking about putting velvet curtains inside so that if I had something where there was a video camera in with me ever, it would look a little more professional because I don't have the, the foam look that people are expecting. Whether I have sleeping bags or curtains, it would be nice to have something that looks a little nicer. So those velvet would be. I, I did awesome. find it. It's, it's called absolute zero velvet room curtains or velvet blackout curtains. And I was a little hesitant because they're incredibly cheap, but uh, they're described as the best soundproof blankets uh, and soundproof curtains by a number of blogs. I'm going to just pick one of many and um, post that right now. Can I ask what sort of blogs you were looking at that what were the topics that they were covering? Was this for podcasters or for <laughs> they voiceover were, artists? Or for? They were all covering um, soundproofing and sound absorption. Uh, soundblackout.com, uh, uh, one um, geekrap.com, you know, on and on and on. Lots of. Uh, besides that, was it like music production or? A music you know production, what I mean? like, voiceover. Yeah, no, I. I I understand a variety of backgrounds. Basically, there's a lots of application where soundproof curtains are called for, and uh, yeah. soundproofingtips.com right here. Let me, um, I'll, I'll put a few links up. Just give me one sec. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Randy had asked, "Does the chat window, the the content of the chat window, uh, get posted somewhere?" And uh, Randy, yes, I will take the contents of the chat window and they will be in the show notes that get posted to the YouTube channel. So open mic VO, there's a YouTube channel. And when I upload the uh, tonight's episode, I will make sure to upload the transcript of the chat window as well, because there's lots of great links in there tonight. Who else has got some questions for us? We have time to fit one or two more of them in. Hello, I'm not, I'm not on a regular uh, vocal mic, I'm just on the laptop mic, but I wanted to talk to uh, Melinda. Um, 
I went to our local guitar studio where they have a whole lot of different mics set up that you can stand there and uh, listen to yourself record with these different mics. And you might have something like that nearby you too. So that way you can listen in the price range that you're looking for uh, your voice recorded with different mics to decide on what one works for you. Um, also, I, I can't have my laptop in with my booth either, Joy, um, because the laptop fan just makes too much noise. So I have it uh, separated from where I am. And that seems to work okay. So I think your wires coming through from your laptop will work just fine. Thank you for that, Cynthia. That's uh, great info. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Cynthia. Thanks. You're welcome. Anybody else have a question that we can slip in before we're done for tonight? Open Hi. tonight. Hey, Anthea. Hi. How are you doing, Graham? Fine, thank you. So nice to have you here tonight. It's always great. <laughs> Got a question for you. Um, I actually have two different microphones that I use, and it seems that um, we live in the Midwest area, and there are certain times that when it's really dry, um, I need one mic, and when it seems really wet, it, it seems like I need another one, the other one, and I go back and forth between an AKG and a 102 Superlux uh, ribbon mic. I believe. I think it's a ribbon mic. <laughs> I'm not real good with these. But I just was wondering if there was anyone out there who experiences this uh, bit with weather fluctuation and if anybody else has to switch mics like this. That's an interesting question. I, I have never kind of heard of people having issues with microphones based on humidity levels. Um, does anybody out there have any experience with this? This is interesting. You know, it, it would make sense to me that the humidity, if it was at one extreme or the other, could have some impact on my, a mic's performance because you're dealing with a, a plastic diaphragm that is literally like between four and six microns thick. I mean, it's just, it's incredibly thin and it is positioned literally like a 16th of an inch away from the back plate or the thing that gets charged with electricity that picks up the vibration of the diaphragm. So uh, it makes sense that, you know, humidity might, might affect that plastic, that very, very thin plastic, that mylar, um, that mylar, um, you know, the tension of it or something but I, I don't know for sure. And now I'm going to have to do some research on that. And <laughs> I hope I'll be able to report back to you next week. Thank now, you. I appreciate it. I'm wondering if it has, if the humidity has an impact on the, uh, what's called attenuation uh, for the ribbon. Uh, in other words, the electric flow gets somehow um, impeded or slowed down or whatever you want to call it, um, mitigated, reduced uh, because of the humidity. I know in drier conditions, you know, it, uh, electricity passes through air a lot easier through dry conditions than through, you know, humid conditions. You know what? Honestly, Anthea, I'm going to do some research on that now, and I will report back to you next week. I'll be here. <laughs> thank you so much. I'm glad to hear that. All of you, thank you. This is wonderful. So with that, we're going to wind it up for tonight. Um, again, remember that this gets posted to YouTube and I will post to YouTube as part of the show notes, all of the chat window uh, back and forth and all the links there as well. Um, really appreciate you joining us tonight. There's so many other things going on tonight between uh, 60 Minutes interviewing Stormy Daniels and the, we've got basketball going on and 
we still managed to get almost 40 people here. So very, very much appreciated. Paul is asking, are we still going to do it next week, even though it's Easter weekend? And hey, I'll be here if you want to be here. Um, I'm not traveling anywhere next weekend. So, so sure, let's, uh, we'll fire up the uh, Zoom and do it next weekend. And we'll see if we get some attendees. So until next Sunday, everybody, work hard, audition a ton, get lots of work. Have a great week. And we'll talk to you next Sunday. Good night. Thanks, Graham. Thank you.